Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. This passage, full of lessons to those who are willing to learn. You know, I think as, as we go throughout life, life is full of lessons. Life is full of things that we can learn from. The question is, are we, are we learning? Or do we fall into the same traps that every generation before us has fallen into? When will we break those cycles? A wise man uh, found this uh, a long time ago and, and wrote it in, in my Bible. A wise man will learn from the experiences of others. And he will be kept from a lot of unnecessary and expensive mistakes. The Corinthians were to learn from the mistakes of Israel, as Paul is, is uh, sharing that with them. And, and, and they're to, uh, to avoid uh, these, these things in their own lives that were displeasing to God. And we see, as we, we read in here, God was not always pleased with his children. Many times they failed. God was not always pleased with the Corinthians because many times they failed. And I wonder today, is God pleased with his people today? I'm talking about you and I, his children. Is he pleased or are there things in our lives that he would look at and say those practices are displeasing? We can benefit from these things if we're willing to open our hearts and minds to the lessons that have been given in times past. As we look at Israel now and, and, and some of the things that they experienced, we're going to look at point number one, their privileged position. They enjoyed a, a, a great privilege of, of uh, blessing and promise, but with that there was no guarantee necessarily of spiritual success. Just as we have God's word today, we can read God's word, but there's no guarantee because we read it, because we know it, that there will be spiritual success in our lives. So Paul is going through and he's listing some of the privileges that Israel enjoyed. In verse 1, all of Israel knew God's divine guidance and protection. We read here that one of those ways was in the, in the form of a cloud. In Exodus 13, 21 and 22, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them by the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and by night. Wouldn't that be an awesome thing to, to, to have God and his, his very presence right there with you? And you could visibly see it as he would lead you. And I wonder, as I, I, I think about this and uh, about that promise, how did Israel miss it? When God is right there with them, how did they miss it? Why did they still stumble and fall? It says that he took not the, the pillar of cloud away from them by day. And he took not the pillar of fire away from them by night. He was always, always there. God guided Israel uh, and protected Israel with the cloud. In Psalm 105, verse 39, tells us that the cloud would, would spread as a protective covering, also to give shade in the burning heat of the desert sun. Now think about that as they're walk, wandering in the wilderness. Um, Israel is a hot place, a lot of desert land. In the surrounding areas where Israel wandered, not a lot of protection from the heat. But God gave them that cloud, not only to lead them, but to protect them. What an awesome God was there to watch over them, to meet their needs. Uh, in Exodus 14, if you take your Bibles, turn there, Exodus chapter 14. 
verses 19 and 20. It says, and the, and the God, the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and a darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these so that, they, that not one came near the other all night long. It tells us that the cloud also stood uh, between Israel and her enemies. It was a, another form of protection, shedding light on Israel, but keeping the Egyptians, keeping those that were following them in total darkness all through the night. What an amazing cloud of promise that Israel had. God right there with them to lead them, to direct them, but to protect them as well. In verse 1, all of Israel passed through the sea, it says in 1 Corinthians 10. They experienced again divine deliverance. God parted the Red Sea for them. When we've been over in, in Israel, it's, it, it's fun to stand in the waters of the Red Sea and look across and just imagine, and we have fun with it, the waters parting on either side. And I think there's a, there's a I, I've got a picture of myself standing there, you know, kind of like Moses trying to part the waters, and it didn't work for me. But to think about walking over on dry ground, and again, God's divine provision for them, and, and divine, in, in this case, deliverance, as he parted the Red Sea, and they walked across, not on muddy ground, and there, there's some that would, would, uh, would, would lead you to believe that, well, it was just very shallow, and, and they were able to walk across. Eh, that's not the truth at all. God's word is very accurate, and it says that as he parted the sea, they walked over on dry ground. And we can believe that because it's God's word that tells us that. God delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh in this particular case. In, in, in Exodus 15, Moses and, and, the, and the children of Israel uh, sang a song of praise to God for his deliverance. Uh, look at, uh, just if you're, if you're in Exodus, uh, look at 15, verses 1 and 2. It says, then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Jump down to verse 19. He says, and for the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with the horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went out on dry land in the midst of the sea. Again, think about this promise. God led Israel across that sea on dry ground. The Egyptian army begins to follow them. And, and, and you can just picture this. As Israel is coming up on the other side, perfectly dry, walls of water, and, and again, I, I, I just think that I would be tempted to reach in and grab some fish out of that water. I'm not sure that they felt that temptation, but, but what an amazing thing. And as soon as they get across, and Pharaoh's army marching in behind them, closing in on them, if you would, God allows the waters to, again, return to their normal state. And it says the Egyptian army was taken out. Again, there are those that would, would, you know, if they tried to share the theory of that shallow water, again, if that were the case, what a great miracle that God drowned all of Egyptian, the Egyptian army in one foot of water. Either way, but I believe how God puts it. Dry ground, walls of water, water collapsing, Egyptian army taken care of. What an awesome promise of deliverance is God there to, del to deliver us today absolutely it may not be a wall of water but his divine protection his divine deliverance is still there very clear for us today he had chosen Moses as his servant leader and 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 again it was just someone to be identified with, to follow after. He was their leader. Israel identified with Moses, the, the spiritual head of the uh, Israel nation. 
verse 3, back in, back in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 10. It says that all of Israel ate of the same spiritual food. Now again, God taking care of them and meeting their needs. In Exodus 16, 4, and if you're there, you can flip back and forth between these two, tells how God rained down manna from heaven for the nations to gather and eat. Just think about that. You never had to go to the grocery store. Ladies, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Step outside your, your front room door, and God brought the food to you. All you had to do was go out and gather enough for the day. Not a toilsome task. All of Israel ate the provisions from the very hand of God. His divine provision. God met their physical needs. All they had to do was go out. If they starved, it was their own fault. All they had to do was go out and gather it for the day. Verse 4 says, says in, in 1 Corinthians 10 that they all ate of the same spiritual drink. Again, God provided their physical needs by food and water as well. If you're out there in the, in the uh, deserts of, uh, of Egypt and, and wandering and, and, uh, and in Israel, it's very warm out there. One of the staples that they tell us when we're, we're on, on trips to Israel is take water with you. It's not in abundance out there. You're not going to find a drinking fountain in the middle of the desert. Israel got thirsty. God provided for them. Paul lists this as the fifth spiritual benefit enjoyed by Israel. Uh, you think about the incident with the, the rock uh, where, where uh, water was produced from a rock in Exodus 17. Mark the beginning of Israel's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Paul goes on to say that, that Christ was the source of this water. Since the incident happened uh, uh, again near the, the end of the wilderness wanderings, Paul is trying to get across the fact that Christ is always there with them, meeting every provisional need that they had. They knew all of these promises, but again, they also knew the privilege of having a divine person with them, accompanying them during the whole time. But all of these privileges again, did not guarantee spiritual success. And you can read that in the Old Testament. You can read that in the book of Exodus. And I wonder again, how did they miss it? If God is right there leading them, directing them, protecting them, feeding them, meeting their thirst needs, where did they go wrong? Where did they miss it? Verse 5 says that with many of, of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And in fact, we know that's true because how many made it into the promised land alive? Two. Two. Of that original group that went out, two trusted wholly and completely in God, Joshua and Caleb. And you think about that and wonder what happened of those original adults that saw all of these things, the same things that Joshua and Caleb saw. Where did they go wrong? Which leads me to think that we have to be careful today. As Paul is trying to share with the Corinthians to be careful because you can fall into the same mistakes is that not true for us today? We don't think so. Look around. Look at churches across America. Bible teaching, Bible preaching churches, and watch the failure. Be careful. God is giving a, a, a warning here. Just because we know the promises, just because we know these things which are true, and God's provision and, and, and protection and, and guidance is always there, doesn't guarantee our spiritual success just because they're available to us. The rest of that original group died. Dead bodies strewn across the wilderness. Paul wanted the Corinthians to pay attention so that they too did not fall into these same 
Point number two, pervasive problems. Pervasive problems. Verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 10 tells us that, that Israel lusted after evil things. They had evil desires. They were not satisfied with God's provision. They were not satisfied with the manna. They complained about the food. They complained about the, 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 what they had to drink. And while, Numbers 11 says, when God provided the meat for them, remember, it wasn't just manna, but he also provided, after those complaints, give us meat that we had back in Egypt. Now again, what a hunting party they had there. Quail fell from the sky. God gave them all the meat they could eat. And while the meat was still in their mouths, the complaining came up. The murmuring was there. And Numbers 11 tells us that God struck them with a plague. Paul is warning the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, and again, the same warning for us today, stop lusting after evil things, the things which come between us and God. Are they there? Every day. Every day. Verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 10 says, lusting after evil things then led Israel to substitute a graven image for holy God. A graven image for holy God. How, again, could they miss it? How could they miss it? This God who had been with them every step of the way, how did they miss it? In Exodus 32, while Moses was on the mountaintop receiving the law, Israel was, was, was sinning by making this golden calf, calf. They even told themselves that they were making this in honor of Jehovah. What a mistake. What a mistake. But along with the calf came everything but honoring Jehovah. Came sensual practices, idolatry, pagan worship, just as it is written Again, Scripture says, they sat down to eat and drink, but then they rose up to play. And Paul was warning this group of, of, of Christians in, in Corinth to stop using, in their case, their excuse of spiritual freedom. Their freedom in Christ, their liberty in Christ as an excuse to sin. Don't we do that sometimes today in our own lives? Verse 8, because of spiritual defection, it always leads to moral defection, which is the third step now in the downward spiral, which led to fornication. The Israelites failed in the area of sexual immorality, and as a result, Paul's, Paul tells us that 23,000 died that day. Think about that. How did they die? At the very hand of God. The warning to the Corinthians that God will judge their immorality, their lifestyle, just as he judged Israel's back in the Old Testament. Be careful where you allow sin to take you. Well, you don't have to worry about me. You know what? I'm sure that this group of Corinthians, this church at Corinth, said those same things. I can also guarantee you that those, those in, the, in the wilderness that followed God, they saw God, made the same promises. Well, that won't happen to me. And yet, they failed. And they fell. Because they did not daily look to the leading of God in their life. Paul was warning them to stop murmuring, stop complaining if you don't want to fall into the same practices as Israel did in Numbers 16, because God became angry with them because of their sin. Paul said all of this, why? To make a point. He wanted the Corinthians to learn from the mistakes. The mistakes that had happened before. Be careful, keep your eyes out, watch. Don't fall into the same traps. 
He wanted them to learn from these messages of long ago, just as we are to do so today, which brings us to point three, the pronounced purpose. Look again at, at, at verses 11 and 12 of 1 Corinthians 10. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition. That's us today, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. Paul says that, that what happened in the past, uh, past is an example for us to learn today as Christian believers. These promises are for us today as well. Be careful lest you fall. They were written for an admonition to instruct us in how to live, how to, 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 to not fall into the vulnerable practices that are around us each and every day. Each one vulnerable, capable of falling if we don't keep our eyes fixed upon the one who is leading us, guiding us, directing us, providing for us, protecting us along every step of the way. So what are we to learn today? If Israel enjoyed position of privilege, how much more so do we today? We have Jesus Christ today. Israel did not, they knew he was coming. They were told of his coming. Today we can look back. He has come. He has come. We know of, 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 of divine guidance and protection. The Lord said to us today, Corinthians, the Corinthians knew it too. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Our God is always there. Anytime we look to him, he is there. He's not on a vacation. He's not, not there. He's always there, always available. Should also be a warning for us not to rely on ourselves for spiritual success. Why did God not leave our ability to get to heaven based upon me, us? Because he knew we would fail. We cannot do it in and of ourselves. We need God. We need him each and every day to live a life that is honoring and pleasing to him. Just, uh, Jesus said that, that no one is able to pluck us out of his hand. He is there to protect us. He's our divine protector. If Israel knew divine deliverance, then so must we today. We've been delivered from darkness into the kingdom of God's glorious, glorious light. What an awesome Awesome promise. Christ has given himself for us. How did he do that? On the cross of Calvary. He died upon a cruel cross so that I, we, if we know Jesus Christ as Savior, might have eternal life. We cannot ever do it on our own. It's only because of his work in us and through us. He's there to deliver us from this, uh, this present evil age, Galatians 1, 4 states. And in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, we learn that, that Christ partook of flesh and blood so that through his death he might render Satan powerless in our lives. Why did he come? To render Satan powerless. To prove who he was and who he is for us today. We, too, have a divine relationship. Just as Israel did with their spiritual leader, Moses, not Christ, just a, a picture, we have Jesus Christ today. We have access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ himself. God sent Christ to die so that we might obtain, again, eternal life. We are in Christ as believers. Look at, uh, look at Ephesians chapter 1. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. where we find a, a wonderful outline of, of, of spiritual blessings. And just look through, as you flip through Ephesians chapter 1. Here, I've got a lot of these uh, underlined in my Bible. Uh, blesses us with all spiritual blessings. Predestined, uh, predestinated us unto the adoption of children. To the praise of his glory, uh, of his grace in verse 6. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin in verse 7. 
all wisdom, in verse 8, having made unto us uh, made known unto us the mystery of his will in verse 9. And you, you go on uh, and obtained an inheritance in verse 11 that we should be to the praise of his glory in verse 12. Verse 13, you are sealed. 14, our inheritance. We are a purchased possession unto, a prized possession unto the praise of his glory. And on and on. Scripture is full of these promises that God has, has given to us. Romans 8 tells us that we are heirs with God. And joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We also know divine provision in the fact that Jesus Christ has given us life. John, uh, Jesus says in John 10 that he came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. But we're in danger of taking our wonderful guaranteed position, just as Israel was, when we fall into evil practices of sin. The same pervasive problems that plagued Israel, that plagued those at Corinth, plague the American Christian society today, the American culture of Christianity. We give in to lusting after evil and and sinful things as well. The attitude of the day is, is whatever makes us happy is what we follow after. Didn't Israel do that? Didn't Corinth, the the Corinthian believers, do the same thing? It's all around us today. Do whatever makes you happy. If you're dissatisfied with God's plan, take take your own plan. Follow after yourselves. You have that liberty. Not true. And yet, that's what we do today. We give in to all of these things. We give in to, to uh, idolatry. We do exactly what Israel and Corinth was doing. We eat, we drink, we rise up to play, and we call it our own Christian personal liberty. Is that what God meant when he talked about our Christian liberty in the Word? Not at all. It was not a license to sin. Never was it a license to sin. And yet, that's what we do today. Before we know it, we follow after this downward spiral that Israel and Corinth and all of the others in between have followed after. We find ourselves morally destitute, spiritually destitute, as we toy with the world's pleasures. Because you know what happens when we begin to toy with these things? We become to get more comfortable. We begin... We, we, we become, uh, we get to the point where we, we, we feel comfortable in doing those things. And that prompting from God to turn from sin is no longer there. We need to get back on track. Get back following after God, his, his hand of leading in our lives. If we don't, we're also told, be careful. Because God's hand of discipline is right there as well. I don't know about you. I I never enjoyed discipline as a kid. I tried to to do my best to avoid discipline. I didn't like it. That was mom and dad. What about holy God? God. If I didn't enjoy the discipline of mom and dad, how much more is the discipline from the hand of God? It isn't good to follow after our own sinful ways. Look to the leading of God in our life. Isn't it good to know the message doesn't end there? Wrapping up here very quickly. Finally, verse, uh, point four, the precious promise. In verse 13, God's word to give us strength and courage. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. Temptation is common to man. You think, it's not just me. God says it's common to man. Temptation is there. It's all around us. You don't think so. Open your eyes. It's there. You are not suffering through through anything unusual, but God is faithful. What a wonderful truth. 
God is faithful. Just as he was faithful to Israel, faithful to the Corinthians, he's faithful to you and I today. We can depend upon the, the, the faithfulness of God, especially in the midst of temptation. Especially in the midst of these trials, these temptations that come in our life. It says that, that he will not allow us to bear anything that we cannot handle through his grace and his grace alone. You and I can't do it on our own. We're destined to failure when we try. We need God's leading, just as the cloud and the fire. We need God's hand of leading in our life today. Once again, we th want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today. 